Hey everybody, Darren Burrows here. Today I'm gonna to take you through preferred returns in real estate investing. Preferred returns are very common on large scale transactions like apartment syndications where there's a general partner and a limited partner, but they're not so common on small scale transactions like joint venture agreements between a working partner and a money partner. For those of you not super familiar with a preferred return, it's essentially a threshold that the investment must pay out to the money partner or the limited partners before the general partner or the working partner gets a share. There can be many benefits to both the money partner and the working partner in this scenario. And I think when you see it laid out, you may wanna consider introducing a preferred return on your next investment. I discussed this topic at a recent virtual monthly meetup that we have co-hosted by Alona Koziol and myself. And so I thought I would roll that footage because there was a lot of great questions from investors from across the country. Before we get into it today, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel. You can also hit the notification bell and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, let's get into it. Darren, if you're ready, I think um, maybe we'll get started. And today Darren's gonna be talking about preferred returns and how to kind of structure your deals so that your investor's really confident in investing with you. Um, and that's about it. Darren, are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. All right. Preferred returns are essentially the minimum threshold that an investment has to return before a working partner or a general partner receives their share. And the easiest way for me to explain this is to just jump right into numbers. So let me give you an example of how this could potentially work. Let's say you had an opportunity that you're, you're wanting to partner on with somebody. Um, this is without a preferred return. And this is a standard 50-50 split on a, on a joint venture agreement. Let's say the expected cash flow on that transaction was $1,000 per month. I'm not going to get into all the other parts of the transaction on a joint venture agreement, but let's just say that as a working partner, I was potentially pitching to my money partner and saying, this property is going to have the potential to make $1,000 per month. And we're going to split that because our agreement is 50 50. Well, that would mean that as the money partner, they would get $500. And as the working partner, I would get $500. What happens if there's only $600 in actual cash flow on that transaction? Because as we know, sometimes expenses aren't exactly the way that we expect them to be, or there could be um, uh, circumstances that arise where the cash flow is not necessarily exactly where we expected it to be. So in that situation on a 50-50 split without a preferred return, my money partner is now gonna be receiving $300 and the working partner is now gonna be receiving $300. And that leaves a shortfall to the money partner of $200 per month. And I know a lot of situations where money partners are lending out capital, they're using a, a home equity line of credit or something like that. And if their expectation is that, that they're gonna be getting $500 a month, and they're only getting 300, there could potentially be an issue where they're you know, a little dissatisfied because maybe they actually have to put money into their home equity line of credit every month to keep that, that afloat. So a preferred return comes in very handy. Let me show you the alternative of that situation. So this would be with a preferred return on the same 50-50 split and joint venture agreement. So let's say we had the $1,000 expected cash flow um, this one's just the same. It's $500 for the money partner, $500 for the working partner. If that same situation arose where you had a $600 actual cash flow with a preferred return, let's say of $500, now my money partner gets $500 in that transaction. And me as the working partner, I would only receive $100 in that transaction. And this is a situation where you can set this up so that it's great for the the working partner, because I get to essentially really dial in on my numbers. I can say, look, I'm, so I, I'm not going to over promise in this situation because if there's a preferred return that my partner is going to be getting, I'm going to try to make those numbers as accurate as I possibly can. Because if I said the property's only going to have $600 in positive cash flow, then my preferred return would be $300 to my money partner and $300 for me. So that it really keeps me in check as a working partner. And as a money partner, if I'm lending out money on that transaction and I've got a preferred return, I can say, okay, well, until that property makes $500, I'm going to be the one that's paid out solely. And then anything after $500, we're going to go back to our, our split or we're going to go back to our agreement. Now, there's a couple different ways you can structure this, right? You could have your preferred return, let's say at a minimum on this same example of $500 threshold. 
And then anything other over the $500, maybe that's when you go into your 50, 50 split or what I would maybe do on a smaller transaction is say the preferred return is $500. Anything then up to a thousand dollars would be my working partners portion. And then anything over a thousand dollars, we would then get into our 50, 50 partnership um, in that scenario. But there's all kinds of ways you can structure this scenario, but I wanted to introduce preferred returns because I think it is something that, gives security to our money partners. And this can be a great selling feature for us as working partners to say, look, until this property makes money, until it makes the, uh, the agreed upon amount that we've, we've come up with, I'm not going to take any cash flow out of this situation. Who would do preferred returns? Um, a lot of large apartment syndicators often uh, offer re uh, preferred returns. Uh, joint venture working partners can put them in as well. And you as joint venture money partners can ask for a for preferred return as well. If this is something that you really feel is important in your situation, why are uh, preferred returns important? Um, because I like them because it, it starts to be comparable to a uh, private lending situation. For instance, if I lent out a hundred thousand dollars on a transaction, and there was a preferred return of 8%, which is a very common syndicated mortgage threshold. Um, I would be guaranteed an 8% return on an annual basis before anyone else would get capital. So that all of a sudden becomes more like a private lending situation where I'm making 8% on my money on, on a yearly basis. So that's comparative to private lending and what you might be receiving on a monthly interest situation. And this is why you can compare now like a joint venture partnership to private lending. It has that element if, they, if your partners have a preferred return. There's an alignment of interest on preferred returns as well, because now both parties are really wanting this property to profit. As a working partner, let's say in this transaction, I really want to make sure that this property makes as much positive cash flow as possible because there's an alignment of interest because I know I'm not going to make any money until my partners have their preferred uh, return paid out. And it lessens the risk to the money partner because there is that, that guarantee, that threshold that we have to hit before um, they get paid out as, as um, a, a working partner in this situation. So I'm going to kind of stop at that point with like, that's all I really prepared because I think it's a relatively straightforward scenario. Um, but I want to just open it up to, to questions now um, and see if anybody has either a question they can throw into the chat box or they can also just, uh, you know, unmute yourself and ask me a question on the, on the screen here. I just wanted to say this is a fantastic idea. I've heard a lot of complaints from money partners that they're not feeling valued, that they're feeling like the working partner sometimes thinks their money just kind of appeared and it's no big deal. So doing something like this shows that as a working partner, you have very much commitment and concern over the finances that your money partner is bringing to the table. I think this is an awesome idea. Like you say, though, you better be damn confident of your numbers. <laughs> Well, I think what it does is I think that it, it I, I see, you know, I see a lot of things in the real estate investing space in terms of working partners, uh, money partners, people, um, for lack of a better term, uh, boosting their numbers to where they probably are not all that accurate, you know, um, using things like a 1% uh, vacancy rate. Uh, I, you know, even in a market that has a 1% vacancy rate, I don't like to use that number because I like to use a minimum three to 5%, depending on the market. I see a lot of times people putting in a 5% market appreciation. 5% is, is very achievable in some markets, but is it a guarantee? No, it's not. So when we start to put those numbers into play, you know, uh, it, it, it can be tricky. So I like this preferred return because it keeps, like you say, what Laurie made, it keeps everyone honest and it makes sure that as a working partner, when I'm putting my numbers out there, I really want to be conservative. And if I'm conservative and I'm, and I'm still able to get that deal across the finish line, well, then my partners, if there's excess there, do you think they're going to be happier when there's more money on the table and we all get to take more out of the transaction? That's a much better situation to be in than the other way around. I do have a question, though. When it comes to the refinance time, then, if you've given a preferred return, do you level it up then to the actual numbers or do you just let it go? So again, there's a couple of ways you can structure the preferred return. You can actually structure the preferred return. And this is what we do on the syndication side on the larger apartment buildings. The preferred return um, actually gets paid down on the initial investment. That, that portion goes um, to reduce the principal 
sort of pay down of the initial investment to the investor. So let's say that same $500 investment was being paid out every single month. Well, that would get paid off of the initial um, capital contribution that the limited partner had paid. And then at the end of that, you know, let's call it that five year term where we are selling the asset or refinancing the asset, that preferred return would be uh, essentially um, calculated in the payout at the end, if that, if, that makes, if that makes sense. That's one way of structuring it. You don't have to do it that way, but that is one way that I see it uh, often uh, laid out in the larger scenarios. Uh, that's something that we did for our Salzburg development, but I'm just curious, is that a, is that a pretty common theme? for a lot of like syndications is you get preferred returns or is it one out of a million to 10? What's the odds of you getting that, that security? Yeah, great question, Steve. Um, I, it's, it's pretty common, I would say on apartment syndication. Um, I think because uh, there is, you're dealing with um, a lot of apartment syndicators are dealing with accredited investors only. Um, and so there is a certain knowledge, a, a certain uh, perspective, if you will, that they have and they, they expect um, to be paid out, you know, first and foremost. Um, and so it is pretty common on the larger scale transactions. And that's why I wanted to introduce it tonight, because I think that as sophisticated investors, I know this group is very savvy. And if we can start to introduce some of these ideas on the smaller scale, I think it really shows that, you know, you're putting yourself out there as somebody who's um, you know, working in your partner's best interest, as I know, you know, you and Randy always are for sure. And that's making sure that your partners are taken care of first and that you're really showing that you care that they make their money back and that you're looking out for their best interest. Randy's dad always said, and it's something that we've incorporated into our business is build your reputation, not your bank account. Yeah. Cause you can, your, your, your reputation. I mean, it, can you imagine if you have a scenario where you were expecting a thousand dollars cash flow every month and the property ends up cash flowing, cash flowing $200, you know, it, it's just not a situation that you're going to see a lot of repeat business. <laughs> but if you can say, you know, there's a, there's a $600 cash flow here, you're going to get a preferred return of 300 bucks and you deliver on a thousand. What's a better scenario, right? You think you're going to have repeat business over and over again as a working partner? Absolutely. And are your money partners going to want to re-up on the next transaction. I know a lot of people in this group work with, you know, uh, working partners and apartment syndicators, and they've done multiple deals Nick, over and over again. And that's because those partners keep, uh, you know, contributing and keep uh, basically uh, overperforming and, um, and under promising. Julia is asking a question. Um, if you do have more money on the table monthly, does it go into the reserve? Um, Yes. It, so, so first and foremost, uh, I like to build my reserve on my properties. Now, th these are the smaller duplexes, triplexes. Um, I like to have about a six month um, cushion for all expenses going into the reserve account. And then I would say I like to have cash flow distributions after that. And this is another conversation you're going to want to have with your partners, no matter which side of the equation you're on is at what point do we start distributing um, capital, right? And how does that work? Is it quarterly? Is it, is it you know, um, monthly? Is it yearly? Um, but I like to build the reserve first and foremost. Um, now on the larger scale, if we're talking larger scale apartment buildings, uh, there's usually a, a reserve fund that's established right from the get-go and cash flow is usually delivered right from the, from the outset um, because they're, you know, if they're an established building, they're generating income from day one. So. Uh, there isn't a lot of need to collect those reserves because if you've got 100 units and only 5% vacancy, well, you've got 95 people paying rent. Um, and unless something significantly changes, you're not really going to need that reserve fund um, unless there's capital expenditures that need to come out uh, right away, which is always should be in the budget right from the get-go. So, Darren, just to add to that, so mm -hmm. if that were the case on your larger scale apartment mm -hmm. um, where you're already walking into it and you know that there's already cash flow, if you do a preferred return, would you just keep it at that and then just be building whatever extra you'd be getting? Or would you go right into the deal and um, even if your numbers were conservative and all of a sudden you superseded that, um, would you still present that money then to your partner? Or would you hold on to that and then present it later? Like what's your general take on if you have that extra cash that you didn't, you kind of didn't anticipate? So if I understand your question correctly, it would be like, let's say you, you were expecting a 
10% return on a monthly basis and the preferred return was 8%, but you, mm -hmm. you actually, the, the, the asset generated 14% return. I mm. would pay that out um, in excess to my partners and to myself as well as the general par partner um, okay. in, in that scenario because um, that is just in a, a great situation where you're, you're, you got enough there that you can, you can deliver on that. Now, okay. the flip side of that is, mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead if you have another question. No, 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 you, you nailed what I was getting at. Yeah, okay, sorry, yeah. and the flip side? The flip side of that is a lot of, um, Steve, to go back to your point, a lot of apartment syndicators will have um, uh, an accrual of that preferred return. So if in year one, the preferred return only hits 5%, the general partner still owes 3% moving forward to make up that 3% that was lost in the first year. So in year two, that 8% would now go to 11%. And until they hit that 8%, they have to catch up. Right. So it's not just like on an annual basis, you get that, you know, if you only hit five, well, too bad for the general, uh, for the limited partner. It's now going on to year two and year three, if it doesn't carry over and year four until that, that person is made whole until their 8% return is paid out. So Adriana is asking, what about on the refinance? Would you have preferred returns there as well? Not generally. No, I think this is more for cash flow, Adriana. Um, preferred returns would only come into play there. On, on distribution, I think that you, know, you would have your splits and you would stick to those splits, whether that's a 50-50 you know, or whatever the partnership looks like, but um, there wouldn't be a preferred return. Although, having said that, and this is something that I, I'm often shocked by where people um, don't quite understand this point, and I know there's probably some people that this is gonna ring true for them tonight, as a money partner contributing to a joint venture partnership, it's really important as, as, the, as the working partner that I'm explaining to my money partners that the money that they put into that transaction, let's say they contributed $100,000 to the transaction. When we go to distribute funds at the end of the transaction, let's say we sell that property, the first person to get paid back their $100,000 is going to be my money partner. And then we're going to split profits based on the joint venture agreement. I think a lot of people sometimes think that I put that $100,000 in and because we're 50-50 partners, when we sell the property, we get to split everything 50-50. Well, no, the initial payment, the initial capital contribution is paid back first and then we split the profits after that. And that's another really important point as a working partner to explain to your money partner because you want to make sure that you know, when you're talking about these things that your partners know that they're being protected very first and foremost, and then you're going to be able to get, um, you know, their, their opportunity after that. Frank, as there can be so many different types of clauses, uh, who would be able to counsel you on what clauses are relevant to each situation? And is there a website for this kind of information? There is, there are so many different clauses, Frank, you're absolutely right. Um, and it just is, it is, I think it just is, is experience um, working with people who have done this before, um, and working with uh, their situation and what's been successful for them. Like I say, we don't see a lot of preferred returns on smaller transactions, but it's very common on the larger ones. And so, you know, it, it's just a matter of learning and a matter of whether that makes sense. And I think the biggest reason I wanted to introduce this tonight was because it is something that is going to be a, an opportunity for you to pitch yourself as a potential partner and a potential partner that is, um, you know, really savvy in a way that if you can say like, I'm really looking out for your interest as my money partner, I want to make sure this is a good situation. Donna is saying, I recently offered a 55-45 split as the costs came in higher than expected on a rent to own investment in Winnipeg. The new investor was really happy um, that you did that. Yeah, absolutely. And this is something that I like that partners do too, is renegotiate splits if their expectations were not met. So if I say we're going 50-50 and I say you're going to get $1,000 a month in cash flow and it comes back and it's 400 bucks, as a working partner, I might say, you know what? I understand that I didn't quite meet your expectations. What if we could go, you know, 55-45 on equity uh, at the end of the transaction? Something as a way to sort of, uh, you know, save face. Um, or maybe it's a situation where you say like, let's, let's give it some time. Let's see how it works out but maybe in a little while we can renegotiate our split at the end of the, uh, at the end of the opportunity. Thanks, Darren. That was, that was a good presentation and I loved all the questions. And I think this is, you know, part of why we're doing all this is we're all learning and I'm constantly learning and it's, it's such a good platform and, you know, 
Darren, we appreciate you, all of us, I'm sure. So that was really insightful. I hope you guys enjoyed that walkthrough of preferred returns and the benefits to both the working partners and the money partners. If you did, go ahead and hit that like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenvoros.com. Again, if you're interested in attending one of our monthly virtual meetups, I'll leave a link in the description below so you can sign up for our next one coming up. And with that, I'll say thank you guys so much for watching. I wish you the best of success on your real estate investing journey. And I look forward to hearing your success stories very soon.